Glory, glory, glory to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's a wonderful, wonderful Thursday that the Lord has made that we may gather here again and uh, <clears throat> receive more from him. We have been learning on uh, leadership. Last week, by the grace of God, it was powerful. It was awesome. And the man of God, doctor and professor, spoke to us deeply on the effectiveness of a leader. And today we are in again by the grace of God. We will not wait for those that are on, still on the way coming. We will continue from where we are. And so without much ado, because I know we are ready to receive the servant of God, I just want to take this opportunity to really appreciate God because of uh, each one of us for creating time to be here. May the Lord God Almighty bless you. I really want to appreciate God because of uh, the prophet of God, uh, Papa Ricardo Morales, all the way from Puerto Rico, who has made it possible that we have this great man of God who is really speaking to our hearts. I want to believe that, you know, anyone that is listening to these uh, teachings, your style of leadership must change because this is so deep. If you miss out on this, then I, I think you, there's a big problem with you. And so without much ado, I just want us to have a word of prayer. Then after that, we're going to, uh, we're going to receive the servant of God who is going to take us from there. And I know that today we're going to learn powerful things that you need to have your, your pen with you. You need to have your notebook with you. And you need to have your Bible with you just in case you want to confirm something and the Lord will bless your life. So without much ado, let's pray. Father, we thank you and we bless your name. We give you glory and praise. Father, we pray this uh, moment that Lord, as we gather here, nations, Lord, to listen from you. Father, we pray let the spirit of God be upon us, Lord. We pray for the speaker, oh God. We pray for your grace to be upon his life, Lord. We pray that, Lord, give us the revelation tonight that will help our nations, that will help our generation, that will help our families, that will help, Lord, even our churches and uh, the style of leadership that we, 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 we've been having. We pray that, Lord, let this come with a revelation and with power. I want to thank you and I bless your name. Thank you for all that are watching. Thank you for all that are connected by Facebook and those that will be connecting, oh God, even on the YouTube, we pray that let this teaching of Father be uh, inspire somebody in the mighty name of our Lord. We pray that Lord, if there is anything the enemy wants to bring, oh God, to, to hinder and to become an obstacle in these teachings. We pray that, Lord, that power, that spirit is broken right now in Jesus' name. Give us the ear, Lord, to, to, to listen and to move in accordance to the spirit of God. We bless you and we give you glory. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray and we believe. We shout amen. Amen. And, uh, without much ado, I want to really appreciate God because of uh, the prophet of God, uh, Papa Ricardo Morales, Amen. all the way from Puerto Rico. You're such a blessing uh, to us, not just to me, but to everyone in our, in our generation today. This is from Puerto Rico, coming all the way to US, coming to Kenya, Pakistan, in, in, in the entire world. We celebrate God for you. Thank you for allowing God to position you in a time like this so that we may, you know, listen from the Lord. And uh, with this extension, I want to really appreciate God for you. Thank you for being part of my life. And I celebrate the grace of God upon your life. And so without much ado, I want us to bring uh, the servant of God to us, who is going to take us from there in Jesus' mighty name. Uh, Papa, the microphone is yours. And now uh, tell us what next. Hallelujah. All right. So God bless everyone. It's a big privilege to be here again. I know God is um, making this possible because he wants us to learn a lot of things that we don't know yet. So we have to learn it so we can be effective in the future that God 
God has for, for all of us. So today we're going to be teaching, not me, the, Dr. Jose Lassen, but I know the teaching is very, very important for us. How can a leader lead from the first chair? So I know God is going to use him in a very powerful way. I want you all to open your hearts, open your mind, open your spirit, especially to receive what God has for all of us today. So I leave the microphone on this camera to Pastor Jose Lassen. Jose, Amen. God bless you to be here. The microphone is all yours. God bless Amen. you. Thank you for all of you. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor, it's a pleasure to be here. And we want to thank uh, Almighty God for allowing us to open up right this morning. So that means that that's an evidence that the work and the will for his life has not uh, has not finished yet. That's why we're here today. So that means it's a continuation of his plans, design, and purpose and will for our life. So for those that don't know me yet, uh, my name is Jose Lazen, and I'm also a pastor, uh, so an evangelist, but a professor uh, from the uh, Be Shalom uh, Ben Midrash Academy, which means the house of interpretation, the house of education. That's what it stands for in Hebrew. So we be um, teaching uh, leadership, also uh, growth and multiplication for the past 33 years. I learned from my mentor, uh, we don't know everything, but we do teach everything that we know, that I know. Everything that you'll be able to define and to explain, then you can talk about it. That means that you know that. But you don't, whatever you cannot define or explain, don't talk about it. So we need to learn that. That means that we don't know it yet. So that's the reason why I always say, I don't know everything, but I will teach you everything that I know because I can explain it to you and I'll be able to uh, define it to you and explain it to you. Amen? So without further ado, we're going to get into... Okay, somebody's mic. So microphone is open here somewhere. So um, last week uh, we talked about how to have a leadership, an effective leadership, uh, and how to be an effective uh, leader. So today we're going to begin on the second part of the first part of how to be a leader and working from the first chair. As a pastor, you need to know that you sit in the first chair. The second chair is the people that work with you, uh, the people that compose uh, your team. And the third chair is uh, your members, the membership. So once you teach from the first chair to teamwork, uh, to the working team, the people, the staff that work with you, then they be able to pass on to the membership. So everybody going to have, everybody going to be able to have the same knowledge, the same information, and also the same principle to carry on these two uh, principles that we must learn. Number one, you have to have a vision. A vision means that from the divine perspective is what God wants to take you. A vision is where he wants you to be at. A mission, it has you get there, how he takes you there. So you have to have a vision and a mission and also for you to uh, fulfill your calling, your leadership, and your ministry. So we also have to explain the historical text. And we also have to develop the vision of the kingdom, not our own vision, but his vision. Because if you don't carry on his vision and trying to carry on your vision, then you are provoking a division. So you separating yourself from him. So having said that, um, I want to share a blessing and important having, the important to having a vision and how the vision can motivate us to achieve the purpose for which you were created and also our ministry and our leadership. So you may hear me say a few different names that you may not know, they're not familiar with, but I will explain them to you. But when we talk about Yahweh, we're talking about 
is uh, his title, an agronism. So when he created Adam and Eve <clears throat> from the dust of the ground, he didn't see them in the glass <clears throat> and or in the glass case. He looked what I have done, okay? So he created them to accomplish something, namely to take dominion and to do the earth, to them and work in the garden and tend it and be fruitful and multiply. He had a vision for them. So in other words, we need to understand, like I was telling the brother a little while ago, we have to understand those first four, four pillars, they had God vision in it in order for us to be able to have a leadership and also to learn the principles to work from the first chair. Because as a pastor, as a prophet, as a bishop, as our, our bishop, whatever the title that you possess right now, you have to learn those four pillars in order for you to be effective in your congregation and they'll start the work which will be affected as well to help you to uh, empower and equip the membership of your congregation. So he also had a vision for us, not only for Adam and Eve, but also for us as a new creation in Jesus the Messiah. He wants us to take care of his spiritual garden, which is your life, your ministry, and your relationship with him. Relationship with him. So, so, God's plantation. So, he wants us to be fruitful in our garden, which is your ministry, to bear fruit. There's a microphone open. Hello. Okay, so he wants you to be fruitful in the garden, which is your ministry, to bear fruit of the spirit and multiply by going, therefore, and making disciples of all nations. So the garden right now that we're in is your ministry, and that ministry has to bear fruit and also making disciples, which is your multiplication of the job that you do from the first share as a leader of the congregation that God instructs you with. So if we go to the text, Matthew chapter nine, verse 35 says, then Jesus went about all the cities of the village, teaching in the synagogue, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. But when he saw the crowd, he had pity on them because they are weary and scattered like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said, he said to his disciples, the harvest indeed is great, but the workers are few. Therefore, this is the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into his harvest. Here we learn a divine principle that the Messiah the Savior said that there is both out there. There's a lot of fishes out there, but it's missing fishes now. There's both, there's fishes, there's fish, but there's no fish, there's no fishes now. So we have to multiply the people that we have. To learn how to work from the first year in your leadership, you have to do and learn this principle and put it into practice so you can see the harvest giving back to you from God. So we must understand what 2 Corinthians says, chapter five, verse 20 said, so we are ambassadors in the name of Jesus, our Messiah. So Jesus has said us as his ambassadors to the world. And as a such, we must honor and represent him in our character, behavior, conversation, when we interact with family, friends, neighbors, co-worker, or study college, et cetera, et cetera. So in other words, 
If we say that we had been born again, he demands from us to change these three aspects in our life. Attitude, behavior, and conduct. Those three things in our life must change. They have to change because those are gonna be the evidence that people see that we belong to him because the Bible that people are gonna read is your lifestyle as an ambassador of the Messiah. So we're learning how to implement and carry on this principle as a leader from the first share, meaning the pastor, evangelist, prophet, bishop, our bishop, whatever title you possess right now. So God hopes that we will be diligent and faithful in our mission. However, sometimes we become self-indulgent, lazy. We commit ourselves to the system in all its forms by pleasing others, ourselves, and as a result, instead of fulfilling our mission, we, we end up harming others with a bad testimony and wasting the time and gift that our creator has given us. In other words, we need to understand this divine principle. To be an effective leader, working from the first share, we must understand this principle. That the same change that you would like to see in other people is the same change that God wants to see in your life. The same change that you want to see in others, the same change that you want to see in our life. So don't demand change from other people when you're not changing yourself. Because God, the only thing that he support is obedience. People grow in years working with the Lord, but they have not grown in knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, neither in intelligence. Because they study the scripture to teach other people instead of study the people to learn themselves. 75% of the ministry are there, according to Barna Institute research survey, 75% of the pastor, they study the scripture to teach other people not to learn. Instead of study the people of themselves to learn how to carry on the vision, the mission that God had instructed them with. So as a pastor, we must learn this principle. When someone is sent as an ambassador of his country to another country, he must represent his government in all aspects. He must honor his constitution and he must be faithful. We as an ambassador of God, must have a life that is consistent with what we profess that we believe and what we confess. What you say that you believe cannot divorce from your conduct, from your attitude, from your behavior, neither from the word that comes out of our mouth. You gotta honor the one that you call your heavenly father. And from the first year as a leader, we got to concentrate individually speaking in a relationship with him to be able to see him changing and transforming our spiritual life. Not others, but us. Like I said, the Bible that people are going to read is the one that you model in front of them. So when someone go as an ambassador, must have these principles within treasure in the heart to carry on and fulfill them. So we must honor his word. Constitution of the kingdom is the Bible. By obeying, since he's the one that guides us, 
for our life. In other words, the Bible is a guidance. And the instruction are our constitution because the word of the father is the constitution of his kingdom. We must be faithful to our call, our vision, our mission, and follow the path of our creator who has not a religion, but a lifestyle. He never gave us a religion. He gave us instruction, commandment, ordinance, in order for us to be imitators of him. He never told us to be a religious people. He told us to be creatures, to imitate his holiness. So Proverbs 23, verse 26, 26 says, give me my son, your heart, and let your eyes look in my ways, not my religion, my way. Have you ever struggled with the issue of giving Elohim, my creator, the control of your life? I do. But I learned something that I will share with you. The only way we can learn to obey our heavenly father who force is learn now how to disobey yourself. In order for to obey him, you have to disobey yourself. It's the best way and the simplest way to learn how to obey our creator, our maker. Just obey myself to obey him. Not to do my will, but to learn to do his. He had to break down our will and able to establish his will upon our life. I'm speaking to leaders because this is what we teach in our institute. The Bible is not about us, it's not about a person. And that person is our Savior, the Messiah, the one that died in our place to pay the price for the sacrifice that we were not able to pay for ourselves in order to reconcile us and bring us back in harmony and peace with our Heavenly Father, because our sin has separated us from him. And the only way we was able to come back to him was by him playing, I mean, paying the price and bring us back to him. He said, nobody can come to the Father. He said, by me. And that's what he said in Genesis chapter three, verse 24. And I forgot to put it down, but he said, when Adam and he sinned against him, he cast them out of the Garden of Eden. He placed cherubims to guard the entrance, listen to this, to the tree of the way of knowledge and good and evil. They were not able to go back into that way. That's why the Messiah had to come to bring us back to the same way because we had drifted away from our way. That's why he said, I am the way. And nobody can come to the Father. He said, by He did not establish religion. He just, he reestablished the way because Adam and Eve ripped us away from the relationship with him. That's why he said in Proverbs 23, verse 26, give me my son, your heart. Your heart in Hebrew is called lev, L-E-V, meaning yourself, your being, not the heart, not the, the, the organ that uh, distribute the, 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 the blood in our blood streams, but your will. And then he said, and let your eye look in my ways. You see that? It's clear right there. He has a way for us. The same way that he gave Adam and Eve, according to Genesis 3.24. So don't struggle to give or to yield or surrender your will to the Father. Just obey yourself. And I guarantee you that you will learn how to obey him. Because you obey yourself and I obey myself daily. Don't forget this principle that I will share with you. We decide to go to bed. He decides if we open up our eyes in the morning. He's in control of our life, not us, but him. This life doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the one that gave it to us. 
he wants it back. But it's gotta be his way, not ours. So giving control to another, to another always goes against our inclination and natural desire. Why hand it over the control of someone we don't know or see. We believe that this makes us vulnerable. So the best thing to do is give our life, the control of our life to the one that knows what's best for us. Working from the first share, you have to surrender your life to the one that gave it to you. To use it the way he knows best, to multiply it the way he knows how, and to give you a production because it's faithful when you do his will, his way. He will never leave you, not forsake you. He will never leave your orphan. He will always provide to you everything that he knows that you need. He will not give you everything that you want, but he will give you everything that he promised that he knows that you and I need. So working from the first year as a pastor, as a leader, as a bishop, as our, our bishop, as a prophet, whatever the title that you use, you must surrender to the one that's sitting in his throne. We sit in the chair, but he's sitting in his throne. The analysis is correct. If we are considering giving control to someone who cannot be trusted because he can abuse you. The Lord will never abuse us. Don't give your life control to someone that you know they're gonna abuse you. A person that's trying to make you to think like him is not a good leader. He's a dictator, he's a tyrant. A leader, good leader, that know the scripture, will always teach other people to know how to think with the mind of Christ. Like Paul said, we have the mind of Christ. The problem is not that we have it. The point is, and the, and the question is, if you learn how to use it, or if you're using it according to the scripture. He has a design. We cannot change that design for our methodology or ideology, humanly speaking. He doesn't work like that. He doesn't care the way you do his will, your will, but he does care the way we have to do his. It's not about us, it's about him. So, if we like to be in control, we like to decide on our own, we like to feel honored and give the heart to, to Elohim, the creator, with all our desire, thoughts, taste, it means that we can no longer act freely, which may seem bad to us, but if we take the trouble to the one that knows better and ask us to give us his heart, we will not be defrauded. He knows best. Whatever problem, whatever trouble, whatever adversity, obstacle, opposition, he knows the mean from the end, the end from the mean. He knows things before they take place. He's omniscient. The one that we need to learn how to trust is him, not people. But when you learn how to trust him, he give you grace and favor to people, he'll be there for you. Because he's gonna bring you the people that he knows that you're next to you. The one that's gonna help you to carry on the vision, your mission and your ministry to give you the growth that you desire and praying for. But you have to yield your life to him. According to Jeremiah, okay? Chapter 18, verse six said, Behold, as a clay in the potter, in the potter hand, so are you in my hands, O house of Israel, including all of us, okay? So that means that the ways of, of the Lord, the way he speaks to us is in a wonderful way. He always looks for parables for us to understand. He goes down to our level. 
of understanding so that we do not lose our teaching. In other words, I'm gonna simplify that. I'm gonna ask a question first to all of us. Before you ask me this question, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you this question and I'm gonna give you the answer at the same time. Let's visualize this. Anybody mean to tell me that the Lord is gonna create us according to his likeness and image? He's gonna give us a book of instruction for us to get to know his nature, his character, his heart, for us not to understand it. That's an injustice. That's an unjust. He's judged. The reason why is that when we approach the scripture, we try to find something that is not there. And what is there, we reject it. That's why we grow in years, not in knowledge and wisdom, because we don't take it seriously, his word, according to the way that he has revealed it and write it and wrote it in the Bible. He wants you to get to know him. But you need to understand that what the scripture said in the literal, I mean, literal sense, we have to put it in practice. He's not gonna create you according to his line, his image. He's gonna give you a book of instruction for you not to understand it. That doesn't make any sense. You need a good teacher, a good as possible. The one to be able to explain the scripture with scripture, not the scripture with a mix of main ideology or main um, teachings. It, that never worked. That's why he said to Jeremiah, listen to this. The man is recursive by nature and always said that a crisis is an opportunity, but in something that the man has always failed is to see a crisis as an opportunity to go and bring it back to God. A failure is the one to see every single opportunity every time he fails. He has to learn the reason why he's failing. He correct that mistake and use that mistake as a step to get to the peak of the mountain. In order for you to get to the peak of the mountain, you gotta take the first step. Not just to look at the peak of the mountain. And once you get there, you have to remain there. It's not climbing the peak of the mountain, it's to remain there. So the only way you're gonna remain in leadership, effective in the hands of God, is being faithful to his word. And persevere to the end, doesn't matter the opposition that comes our way. So it is easier for a physiology, a sorcerer, a guru, bag, etc., have failed to understand that the one who can best repair our life is the one who created. Jeremiah went to the potter house and saw him making a vessel. As often happened, the shape of the vessel was damaged in his hand. Remember, from Adam and to us, we are defective creatures. We are able to invent things, but we cannot create nothing. He's the creator. We are the creatures. Even though the vessel was damaged in his hand, the potter do not throw the clay away. He use it back on the spinning wheel to make it again. See, we fall short, but in the Messiah, Jesus, he has made us brand new again. But we have to remain in the potter's house, in the spinning wheel, to be able to perfect our life. People say, nobody's perfect yet, but that doesn't give you the reason for you not to learn what is right. That's an excuse. That's a crutch. The Messiah said, be what? Holy? Because 
I am holy. In other words, he's saying you must mature. Holy and perfect in Hebrew is tamin. D A M I M. Tamin, meaning that you grow in knowledge of your maker each and every day. You have to be a best leader today than the one you were yesterday. So a disobedient daily had to be diminishing daily to learn to do what's right. Because obedience is to do things right now, not to delay, procrastinate for another day. It's today. So moving on, I don't have to happen, like I said, he did not throw away the clay, did not put it aside. He took it back in his hands and began to process it again. If you are in the middle of a crisis and you are tempted to seek help for another person, no, come back to Yahweh, to Elohim. And let me tell you something, no one has a capacity or the power to take the clay of your life and shape it again, only the potter. He does that in the spinning wheel. As a leader, the word from the first chair, you have to focus, keep your eyes fixed on the Lord, the altar and finisher of your faith. And I'm gonna ask you another question. When did you make a deceiver that has given you a benefit? The people that come to deceive you, they come to our life to try to take something from us that they don't have, that they know that we possess and they want it. And in order for them to get it, they have to deceive us. We have to be deceived. In other words, they're going to lie to us because they're trying to obtain something from us. And the only way they're able to get it from us is by lying to us and deceiving us. Meanwhile, check it out. In serving Jesus, he's a deceiver. I'm not saying that Jesus is a deceiver. I'm using that as an illustration, as an anachronism. How come your life in the year that you have been working with him has been changed and transformed? He's serving him, he's being deceived. Now, he's serving Jesus and your life has been changed. So as an illustration, as a deceiver, he has given you benefit. He has not taken nothing away from you, only your rebellion and rebelliousness. And he has changed your life. So let me serve this deceiver because ever since I met him 33 years ago, I haven't been the same. So this deceiver that I received as a benefit is good. And I'm gonna continue serving this one that people say that he's a deceiver. Like the Pharisees and the Sadducees said, I want you to just take that to the bank. So they will be able to recommend a solution to you. But the real problem will continue because it is not a question of the vessel, but what you have done with it. But God can take it in his hand, mold it again, give it new life, fill the vessel with, with your life, with all the necessity elements so that he goes ahead, live victorious life, and glorify him. So this is a true excuse me, story that I, that it happens in our ministry. In one of the leadership and training seminar that, and worship that we have one time, um, this person came um, and, and, and shared this with us. He said, I want to share this with you, a true story of a great friend and 40 years uh, old and second, and 40 years old and second share leader. He used to work in the second share, not a person. He was not a pastor, he was working he was the right hand man of his past. And thank to us uh, for finally um, validating his ministry. He said, for the last five years, 
I had been struggling with my spirit, with my role as a second share leader. In other words, he said, I don't want to fall into the trap that Cora fall into trying to take and envying the ministry of his cousin Moses. Listen to this. When you don't know your calling, your function as a member of the body of Christ, you will always envy somebody else's ministry because you don't know yours. Did you get that? So the second share is the lecture that helped me to fill my conformity with all my call is unique function in the body and that I am at the center of the eternal will for his, this season of my life. Our experience is that the struggle of his leader are widely shared among his peers now. So in other words, he said, my pastor is my pastor. I don't have to envy that share. That belongs to him. Because today I have learned in this worship and this seminar that I have a place in, in the body and I have to learn how to carry on my own function, individually speaking, in the ministry that, I have, that God has trusted me with and gave me the pleasure and the privilege to work hand to hand, side by side, next to my leader that before I came to this congregation, he was already sitting there. Honor your leader, God will honor your ministry. We're not gonna be able to finish all this because this is just one of the parts. This is a three-part three series of a, one of the courses that we teach in our academy. So we blessing you with all this and you'll be able to have this. Uh, you don't have to pay a penny. You know, we always uh, uh, soar wherever we go. We don't go places looking for nothing. We just go there to think. To, to, to bless people. So even though we are grateful to have a stimulus ministry, we understand that we are not, listen to this, the ideal source of support for the second share leader. Senior pastors need to take note of this hunger and need for validating in the life of the second share ministry. You must work directly with your staff member. The people that are part of your teamwork, you have to meet with them, reunite with them often to, 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 to deliver, to transfer this knowledge, this wisdom, this understanding, this intelligent discernment for them to learn how to work from that second share. So when they call to be a pastor, that will never forget what you did and deposited in their life. The Messiah says it, he said it. Go ye and make disciples, instructing them to, to hold back and learn everything that I told you guys. And then I will be with you always. In other words, say, if you teach other things, I will not be with you. But if you teach those people that you make with new disciples uh, in all the nations, According to what I told you guys, I will be you always. So we must learn the word that come out of the mouth of, of, the mouth of our Messiah. We cannot go against what he teach. We have to learn his teaching, his doctrine, because this is the only way he's gonna be able to support us. By saying what he said, repeating what he said. This is why I'm gonna give you another, another insight. I don't read the Bible. I allow the Bible to read me. When I read the Bible, I don't do what she said because I'm looking for something that is not there. But when, you, when the Bible reads me, it says, Jose, here you learning, here you growing, here you lacking, here you sinning against me. You need to change this here. She's reading me. That's why I don't read the Bible. She reads me. So the analogy of a marriage that we use to describe the relationship between the first and second share 
as an important application for the senior pass. That's why we're talking to you today, not to the second share, but you in the first share. And the one that is talking to you is the one that worked for 28 years out of 33 years in the ministry that I grew up from the second share. Three years later, I'm in the first share in 33 years. We have been blessed with a beautiful congregation, assembly, with a well, healthy, balanced academy, and with the best people that I was able to meet, which is Pastor Ricky Morales and all of you people. That even though I haven't met you yet, you got a place, a special place in my heart. And we got five minutes left. Hopefully we come back. Maybe it's going to take us, maybe, who knows? Whenever God wants to put, I mean, this uh, aside, but it's going to take us, I don't think it's this month, I guess, this is a, it's going to be a continuation because this is a lot. And just those three courses that you're about to get and be able to deposit into your spirit. But, the first share, listen to this. You know, the analogy, okay. Just as a marriage cannot take place unless both spouses teach each other with love, association between leaders requires intentionally from both parties. I learned in school. I learned in the yeshiva that the teaching will never start as the student is ready to begin. God will never teach you if you're not ready to learn how to obey him. You can learn things from him. That doesn't mean that you know him. He don't want you to know things from him. He wants you to get to know him. Once you get to know him, it will help you to understand his things. <laughs> so the idea, the senior pastor should attract his subordinate and he should be respected when the other party to a lesser and tech take the initiative. In other words, me working from the second share with my pastor was in the first share. He had an idea or he had a suggestion. I was not able to contradict that suggestion unless it was against the scripture. Because the scripture say, it's better to obey God before men. So I'm not here to obey men. I'm here to obey God. But once the men work for God, obey God, then I respect that man. That I do. Acts chapter 5, verse 39 says, so the only way I was able to change that suggestion or idea from my senior pastor to sitting in the first chair was if my suggestion or idea was able to take that suggestion to another level. Yes, I was the one taking the initiative. He was able to receive it because you don't know everything. You need to know what you don't know. And everybody was created to do something that you was not able to do. But you had to learn what God created you to do in order for you to do with excellency. You know why? Because good is the enemy of what is best. And what is best is the enemy of what is excellent. God deserves excellency. Know what is best, know what is good. We got one minute left. So the first share, we hope that you will look for opportunities to establish the relationship that you will offer encouragement to your second share leaders. But you must also go beyond the war and diffuse stage of support to your people. Okay, they need to recognize the unique gift that a second share makes to the congregation and allow them to make significant contribution. 
one of the most important functions of any first share is to transfer its authority to the second share leaders. Like the Messiah said in John 5 verse 19, offers an important word for the second share, work within the limits established by your superior. And look what it says in John 5, 26, 27, verse 36. For the Father has life in himself, so he has given the Son to have life himself. And he has also given the authority to execute judgment because he's the Son of Man. For the work that the Father gave me to fulfill, the same words that I do, I testify by my Father, that the Father has sent me to do. And he has sent us to do what the Father sent him to do. So as an ambassador of the Messiah, we must do his will, his way from the first year. With that, we finish. Thank you for listening to me. You got, you got more time. Oh, I thought it was an hour. No, but we started later. Okay. So we continue. As a senior pastor, do you give your second share the opportunity to finish the work? Do you serve in your duties with authority? If not, what prevents them? What prevents you from doing so? Are you afraid that other people grow and shower and blossom? You should not be afraid of that. Proverbs 21, a verse that I forgot to put down here. Verse 25 says, fear of men will enslave you. But when you honor God, he also to you. Don't be afraid of other people growing. You should be afraid for you yourself not grow or not growing yourself. Individually speaking, nobody can do for God what he created you to do. That's why you have to learn to do his will, his way. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse two says, okay? So made the investment of helping the second share to grow as an effective leaders. I'm speaking to the first share leaders right now. So you learn how to walk and work at the same time with those people, your staff members, for them not to have to be envying you, sitting where God placed you, because eventually one day they will be there. And if not, wherever they are, they're going to blossom. They're going to be used of God as a tool, as an instrument to be a blessing on other people. Remember, Jeremiah only had one disciple, Baruch. Elijah had just one. So sometimes you may not see a lot of people in your church, but the people that you have, those are the ones that you got to equip, capacitate, and train, and educate to carry on the will of the Father. Because the Messiah only had 12. He revolutionized the century when he was here working on, on earth for three and a half years. They turned the world upside down, only 12 people, because they had the right instruction and the right teacher. Either one, even though one became a traitor. Because sometimes the problem is not the teacher, sometimes the problem is the student. Judah had the best teacher, the best instruction, the best counselor. He never fulfilled his calling. Did you get that? Judah had the same instruction that the other pastor had, the same teacher that they had, the same example to learn how to walk with the father but he decided otherwise. Anybody that talks about a different gospel, the contradict the word that comes out from the mouth of the Messiah, flee from that place. We was not called to 
teach people how to think like us, to teach other to learn how to think like the Messiah. He has blessed us, he has blessed us with his mind. You must develop it. So, made the investment of helping your second chair leaders to grow as an effective leader. So, that you are interested, show interest in them, and that you believe in them by training them, sending them to train, training active or activities, and by giving them the opportunity to success or occasionally to make them fail. Remember, I'm not a successful person. I'm a failure. I graduated from failure university. You know why? The diploma that I received once I graduated was success. <laughs> success always visit my house because he knows that I need him to be my professor for life. That's why I never went to the school of successful people. I went to the school and graduated from a failure university because a successful person is a failure that never gave up. A champion was a loser, never gave up. And that's me. That's why I became a champion, never gave up. So when you become a champion, nobody talk about your bad record. Talk about the crown now. Senior pastor, if your ministry is to bear fruit, you need capable and passionate second share to serve with you. And that's your responsibility to educate them, train them, equip them, and capacitate them. There are three and 30 characteristics that the leader of the first year must learn to develop in our educational core and ministry. In our congregation, we believe more in education than service. You said, Pastor, it's like you contradict. No, I'm not contradicting myself. Your mind may be contradicted. But I was playing that to you. In order for you to have a good service, you must be well educated in the will of the Father. Because the Father's will, nobody can change it. And the only way you're going to serve according to what pleases Him is according to His precepts, commandments, instruction, ordinance, and laws. Without that, then you got a service you don't have his approval. And I'm gonna give you another example. User has good intention. When the ark stumbled, when they took the ark, King David, from the Philistine, they went against the father's will. David knew exactly the way the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to be carried on by the Kohanim. Kohanim is the priest. But they put it in an ox and in a wagon. And it says that the wagon stumbled and user went to prevent that. And God struck him. He had good intention. But outside of the will of the Father, there are bad intentions. Because his will has to be done his way, not ours. But you get that. You must learn to do his will his way. So as a leader, we must learn these 30 characteristics. And we're going to learn them from an imperfect man. Because God used imperfect people, listen to this, to show and teach us how to perfect people's life when they deposit themselves into his hands. <laughs> hey. 
This is an imperfect people, person, and God is using him to teach us. If you do the things he learned from me, even though he was not perfect, I perfected his life. I will do the same thing with you if you put in practice these principles in your life. Number one, an effective leader. Have a clean hands and pure heart. Clean hands mean that you got to do his work in season and out of season, but according to his design, according to his plan, according to his will, and according to his purpose. Nehemiah has this. I'm not going to read the version, but you got him there. Number two, an effective leader are convinced that they have a call from God. Don't call yourself. Don't play yourself when God has not placed your call you to be. Leaders, I'm going to give you another insight. You cannot have the right people in the wrong position. But also, you cannot have the wrong people in the right position. You have to learn people's ability. You have to learn the ability, the capability, and also the potential and ability. When you know those three things, then you'll be able to channelize the gift and the talent. Those five things, you have to learn how to put them together in your leadership to have an effective leaders working hand by hand with you from the second shift. Number three, an effective leader set reasonable and achievable goals. You must have a goal. But in, in the other hand, you're not supposed to have any goals. And I will explain that to you. I'm not going to confuse you. Believe me, everything that I'll be able to define and explain, I teach. But I don't Whatever I cannot define and explain, I will not talk about it. That means that I don't know it. But if I know it, then I, you are going to hear my mouth. Why you should not have any goals? Because you are your own goal. You're the one that got to get there. <laughs> but once you know your capabilities, abilities, and potential, then you that means that you have channelized your gift and your talents. Then you know how to get there because you're walking with the one that is taking you there because the vision is where God wants you to be at. The mission is to learn the principle how to get there. But you have to set goals in order for you to learn your people the world with you to be focused and be able to see where you're taking them. Because here comes the, the fourth characteristic. An effective leader made prayer a priority in their life. And I was playing this real, real, real quick. When you pray, prayer means, doesn't mean that you say, that when you talk to God, or Elohim, my creator, you're gonna tell him what to do. No, prayer is for him to learn to do what he wants you to do. Prayer is not to change his mind. Prayer is for him to change your mind. Prayer, it's not for you to tell him to do what you want. Prayer is for you to learn to do his will his way. Prayer is not for you to be asking to give you stuff. Prayer is to be grateful and, and give him thanks for everything that you have received from him. Because it's not what bad things happen to good people. In the kingdom of heaven is why good things happens to bad people. It's the opposite. <laughs> Effective leader number five, reestablish their priority in order to achieve their goal. You, you have to sit down as a pastor, as a leader from the first chair, and you have to look everything that you said that this year we were supposed to accomplish. Then you're going to talk about the thing that you was able to fulfill, to get done. 
and how you got there and you explain that to the people. But also you have to check on the other hand, the people that you was not able to accomplish, the things that you was not able to do, why was not done and correct those things. That's how you work. That's how you prioritize and organize your agenda, your schedule. But your schedule must always in line in alignment or in agreement with the schedule of your father. Number six, an effective leader act decisively when the time is right. You don't go out there when you know it's not time to go. That doesn't mean that you're gonna go evangelize. Evangelize every time, every day, in season and out of season. He's talking about here, when you are about to select people to work with you, Nehemiah is giving us here the example. Remember, they was crying because the wall of Jerusalem was rubbish. It has been destroyed. And he wanted to go there to reestablish the city the way God intended it to be. Not to con reconstruct his house, but the house of the Lord. When you put the house of God in order, he will always keep your house in order. Did you get that? Effective leader are personally identified with a tax. You must know what God calls you to do. You don't want to be in ministry to be famous, to be recognized, to have prestige. No. You want to be in leadership because you want to be faithful to the one that loved you first. And you want to love him back the same way he's telling you how to love him. Listen to this. When you put Elohim, God, first, you will never be second. You will always be first. That's what he said. Listen to me, my son. Give me your heart and your eyes. See and seek my way. When you put him first, you will never be second. Effective leaders seek to be surrounded by reliable allies. You must know the people that you got next to you. You sit down with them one, one by one. Does that mean that you're spying them, that you're investigating them as an FBI or CIA? No, but you need to know where they came from, their background, what they used to do. Because right now, you are in the kingdom of God. You're not in the kingdom of darkness. And here we work according to his structure. We must learn from Solomon. Psalms 1, 34, 39 verse 4 says, the word is not even in my mouth yet. And God, you already know it. He knows all of us. It doesn't mean that you're going to diminish or degrade people. It means that you want people to elevate you to another level. And you elevate them to the place that they're supposed to be at. Because a good leader is the one that takes people not where they want to be at, Good leaders don't want to take people where they don't want to be because that's where they're supposed to be. It's the other way around. Effective leaders provide a vision to follow for their people. You got the verses there. An effective leader do not hesitate or faint in the face of the opposition. That's when you really show the true colors, and the type of leader we're supposed to be. In the opposition, not when everything is going well. Remember this, what is impossible for us is possible with Elohim, a creator, a maker. So my job or my responsibility, my duty as a leader is not to try to learn what is impossible because that means that I will take his place and I will be like Satan. 
I will be like him. I will sit in his throne. No, 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 no. My job is to learn what's possible. Because the scripture said, Deuteronomy 29, 29, the thing that I hidden belongs to him. When revealed to men are for men. So the thing that I revealed for me, those are the ones that I have to learn. Now what is it hasn't been revealed to me? Those mysteries belong to him. He revealed mm -hmm. those mysteries whenever he feels like it. Not when I want it. So you must understand that. Effective leader, execute the plan in order to meet the goal. You must have a design, you must have a blueprint. You must learn geographically the people that live around where your church is at, where your, where your, your, your assembly is located, who lives there, why they believe, how can you get to them? Reach out to them. You have to learn these things. Being a leader, being a pastor doesn't mean that you open the gate of the of the congregation and you close it. No, there's more to it. You have to know the surrounding, the zones around you. You know, you have to know that geographically. Jeremiah, I mean Nehemiah knew that. Okay, because an effective leader act urgently when it says they arrive. Okay, effective leaders are very visible, available, and accessible. It's not that here comes the prince of prince, and everybody move up and face. The way because the prince is walking into the podium. No, 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 no. It's not way like that. And you see many of them that does that. You must be this type of leader like the Messiah did. You must be visible, available, and accessible. But how do you do this? You cannot trust everybody at the same time because you don't know. You gotta understand, intentions are invisible. But the words, when they come out from their mouth, they confirm them. The Messiah said, the mouth speaking from the heart. So you gotta ask questions to people that want to talk to you. So what is the problem? Okay, what did you hear for? And sometimes you must understand that people, when people ask you a question, they're asking you three questions in one question. And you have to know this. You may say, how, how do you know that's pastor? Simple. When people ask you a question, you must learn from the Messiah. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and those are people that was against him. He used to come to him and ask questions. He responded to them with another question. He never gave him the answer. But I will explain to you what I'm trying to say, and I will define that to you. When people ask you a question, they got three questions in one question. Number one, they're asking you a question because really they need the ones to know. Number two, they already had their mind made up. Number three, they look at what's Kago to say when they do whatever they said, they said, Pastor so and so told me that's why I did it. So you're going to ask which of those three questions is your question. You must learn this. Because an effective leader encourages and motivates people with the right intention. Effective leaders express their dependence on God's help. You depend, you trust and depend on Elohim, your creator. Not on people, but on him. But knowing this, that he bless people for them to bless you. That's how he blesses you. The same way he used men to talk to men, he blessed people to bless his people. He did the same thing with Egyptian when they was about to leave to be set free from captivity. The scripture said that he's pour out favor and grace upon them. When they went to the Egyptian, they gave him everything that they needed. He said to this, in order for you to enjoy liberty, you must depend and trust God at all times. Not on Pharaoh, but on God that set you free from Pharaoh. Effective leader 
okay? Sacrifice themselves personally to achieve their goal. Effective leaders take care of financial care for their people. How do we do it? In, in the East Shalom, House of Peace in New York, people tie and offer in a congregation. The government is not supposed to be helping them when they are in need. We are. So they pay tithes and they give offerings there. How do we do it? You bring the bill and we pay. But we also gonna instruct them for them not to depend and you to multiply like, I, I use that as an, a figurative speech or as an illustration. You multiply the fishes and the bread. No, you wanna teach them how to fish, how to bake bread after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you multiply the, the, the fish and the bread. Yeah, the first time. But the second time is I'm going to teach you how to fish. And I'm going to teach you how to bake. You instructed them in the principle of the Father for them to learn how to depend and trust in Him. Amen? So an effective leader refuses to leave at a higher level than they people. Nehemiah says that. You got, you're seeing people out there that they got, I'm not saying nothing, I'm not criticizing negatively. No, I'm saying what it is. That people are dying of hunger. Meanwhile, they got put in the house and they don't share a piece of bread with the same people that put them up there. You think that's fair? You think God is pleased by that? Of course not. The Messiah said that the Son of Man doesn't even have a place to lay his head. I mean that you got to live in poverty. That's not what I mean. What I mean is the possession cannot take the place of your God because he said, you shall not have another God before me. So everything that takes his place is your God. He's supposed to be first, not second. That's what I said. When you put him first, you will never be second. But everything you, you put in place before him, that's your God. And you bow down to him. He said, you shall not have another God. You shall not bow down to them. So anything that is first in your life, that's your God. Not the God that created you. An effective leader. Do not hesitate to apply and discipline in cases in appropriated behavior. Nehemiah gives us the example here. You have to correct people. People say, do not judge for you not to be judged. He's not saying not to judge. He said, don't do that hip hypocritically. He said, when you're going to judge, judge the right judgment. Judging means correcting people, not the way people put it out there. When people say, God knows my heart, they're telling you, I don't want to stop doing what I'm doing, so don't tell me anything. That's why they say you're judging me. You're not judging anybody. You're correcting people. And God will always back you up. He will support you. When you're living a life according to the pleases him, that's why he placed you there as a judge of his people. If you cannot judge anybody, then you got to erase the book of Judges from the Bible. Then. You see what I'm saying? You're being told wrong. You're not receiving the right correction. You're not receiving the right instruction. We're not receiving the right uh, education sometimes. Am I saying that, um, that I, I'm projecting myself? No, that, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the Bible says what we're supposed to say. The Bible says what we're supposed to do, but also say how to do it. But most of the teachers today, they tell people what to do, but they don't teach you how to do it. The Messiah told us what to do. He gave us the example. And then he told us how to do it. And what we get when we do it. Because God, oh, we, the only thing that he honored is obedient. In eternity, years, age, doesn't even count, brothers and sisters that are listening to me. In eternity, the only thing that counts is your obedience. 
King David said in Psalms 119, verse 97, he said, you have made me wiser than all my enemies. You have made me more wise and educated than all my teachers. And you have given me more knowledge than all the others in Israel. How King David was able to, to do that? And we believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. And it's right there in Psalms 118. That means that God only sees obedience, not ages. The Messiah said to his disciple, if you don't do and believe like this little child, you will not make it into the kingdom. Because in the eternity, age don't count, only obedience. And we're going to leave it there. It's 2.30. Yes, I, I think it's enough. Wow. <laughs> this is a powerful teaching. My God. Robinson, you got your mic right now. Turn on the mic. Oh my God, it is so powerful. You know, um, I, <laughs> I've written until now my, <laughs> oh, thank you very much, doctor, for such a deep insight. May the Lord bless you. I really don't want to add any other thing on top of that. What I want to do is to go straight forward to the questions because a good student is the one that once the teacher has taught the word, the way we have received the word, you're free to ask the teacher. And teacher, you say this, but I never understood what you say. So that is the way to learn. So I want to believe that each one of us we're going to be so fast in asking the questions because remember this, we are learning on the three chairs of a leader. And so we have, you have received it. I don't want to repeat it. It is so powerful that you cannot miss even a word. So I want to open the meeting as I celebrate each one of us. I want to open the meeting and uh, uh, it's time now for questions. And uh, doctor is with us, professor is with us, the man of God, anointed for this uh, very hour, anointed in our generation to help us understand what is all about leadership. My God, this is so deep. And so I want to celebrate each one of you and uh, now ask you, please, if you can unmute your mic and uh, raise up your hand and ask the question because we've just done the characteristics we are up to the characteristics so on the interest of time we will just uh you know allow the doctor to continue next week from there but now it is time for questions let's ask questions my silent interruption is that uh I can continue, but the point is that I got another conference. I got another conference at 6.30 today here in Puerto Rico. Uh, okay. But I'm, 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 I'm open right now. I got time. I got time for the question. Good. So let's, let's uh, react on this. Let's uh, ask questions, and uh, that would be a great blessing. Amen. That would be a great blessing. Questions, questions. The, the first chair, do you have any question on the first chair where the man of God spoke to us about the first chair? I remember he mentioned the vision. You know, you must have the vision, the first chair. Any question? Good to see you, Reverend Nelson. Good to see you, man of God. God bless you. Good to see each one of us. Good to see Pastor Philip. God bless you for being here. Good to see you, Apostle Evans Ayuka. 
Wow, I know all of you. Good to see Nancy. Shalom. Well, good to see you, Bishop Obadiah. Are you, are you raising your hand up? You have a question or something? Let's ask questions on the interest of time because we don't have much time. I'm giving this opportunity to ask questions. Maybe the man of God said something that you didn't understand. Just raise your hand and uh, we'll be able to address that. Reverend Nelson, any question from your end? Uh, no question for now, sir. No, let's ask questions. Let's ask questions. This is a deep, this is a deep uh, teaching that we cannot go silent on this. Oh my God, I've never heard this before. Mm. No, perhaps I need to start asking, then others will follow by asking. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. There is something you say that, that senior pastor, if your ministry is to bear fruits, you need to capable and passionate second chair to serve with you. Now, there is this issue in leadership. For example, you're a senior pastor. Rather, you are a servant of God. This sounds like it's out, but I want to bring it close. Between the, the, the shepherd, between the shepherd and the sheep, who is supposed to bring the people in the house of God? Well, you got to understand that the shepherd don't become pregnant. The sheep is the one that had to multiply. <laughs> that answer your question. They had to bring people. How do you do it? For it? <laughs> the sheep is the one that got pregnant, not the shepherd. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, oh my. For instance, for instance, let's say that right now you have, as an example, Let's say that you have 100 people, 100 members, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say each one bring one, one service. Each one bring one. I mean that you have 200 people, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If those, so that's how you have to challenge them. People say, oh, I don't know too many people, but they have 100 contacts on the phone. Mm. They have 100 contact people on the phone, 100 friends in the, in the cell phone. But they don't know nobody. No, you know somebody. Mm -hmm. So that means that you're gonna. It's there somewhere. And that's my wife, the, my, the pastor, the lady, first lady. I see my question. Sorry, but they have to be able to motivate themselves, passionate themselves, passionate mm -hmm. themselves to invite other people. For instance, for instance, let's say right now, if you see this, this is an example. Let's say right now. We're walking on the street and we see this big giant person, let's say with a baseball bat, mm -hmm. handy, about to crush a little boy uh, head. We pray that never happened, but it's an illustration. The dangers that not telling people they need that, or the relationship that they need with their savior is something like that, more or less, as an example. Will you do something to prevent that? Of course you will do. Maybe you may not jump the guy, but you might call the police because you know an atrocity is about to take place. So the people that died today without knowing Jesus, they wouldn't have a second chance. So you have to let them know that they taking a big risk to die today without knowing the reason why they was created and being re reconciled and saved by the one that paid the price for them to be saved. Mm -hmm. So you need to invest, I mean, to, to, to invest time in your friend, knowing these two principles. Number one, you're not responsible when people say no to 
to, to Yeshua, to Jesus. That's not your responsibility. That's their responsibility. But you're responsible never to deny the opportunity to say yes to him. That's your responsibility. Mm -hmm. How many times you say no to him, but now you're minister? Did you get that? So my job is they say no, that's their responsibility. My job is never to deny the opportunity to say yes. Wow. That answer your question? Yes, sir. No, thank you. Going to the uh, the 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 characters of uh, of a leader, the yes. characteristics of an, an effective leadership from yes. the first chair. Now, looking at point number two, mm -hmm. where, you, where, where you mentioned that effective leaders are convinced that they have a call from God. Mm -hmm. The question is, many people are really struggling by this point. Okay. Because there are, they are, they are, they are people, there are men of God and women of God, they are really struggling by this point because most of the people really don't know that, you know, God called them. Now, mm -hmm. how do you get that conviction? Or rather, mm -hmm. how are you going to be convinced in your spirit that God called you? Because what I've seen in our generation is that, you know, uh, somebody leaves the church. People have this tendency of just leaving the church. They go somewhere and they scratch their head like, who do they think they are? And mm -hmm. then they go and they open a church, not because they heard from God, but because they have seen other people do this. So now they're in the field, they are like in the marketplace and now they are in it. And some of the people you see around, it's like they just, they were trying. It was like a trial. Then it happened. Mm -hmm. It happened that they are now running churches. Now, mm -hmm. how do you get to that? How can a, an effective leader be convinced that they have a call from God in, a, okay. in order to avoid mm -hmm. all the, the up and downs and not sure and what, what, do I, what am I going to do next? Because when God has called you, like you mentioned, there is always a provision for that. Yeah. But you well, find that a lot of people don't understand whether God called them or they call themselves into what they're doing. Okay, is that, that is very simple. That is very simple. If you read, <laughs> it's simple. If you read Proverbs 18, verse 17, you can write that verse down. Okay, that's a verse that you can write down. And then I'm going to take you to, to give you the answer biblically. Okay. Proverbs 18, verse 17. Also, you could read Proverbs 28, verse 9. And you could also read Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. Those three verses right there confirm if you have been called by God or you have called yourself. You could call yourself and your charisma are able to bring people. For instance, for instance, the way you dress may withdraw near you, I mean, maybe bring closer near you a lot of people because you have a charisma and people will follow you for that. I mean, giving a simple example to take you to, 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 the, to the answer. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, they have a lot of people. Were they doing God's will? Of course not. They were using God's name. Yes, they were. But God was never there. Now, by calling yourself, you could bring a lot of people. You could use a Bible. And you could teach about things of God. But your life will never change, even though you're sitting in the place that you place yourself. There's nothing new. But when God calls you, People will confirm that. Now the people that you buy the favor from to be with you, 
But God's people, they're going to follow you and they're going to make you understand that you have been placed by God by working with you without any personal interest. That's what the Messiah said. In order for you to be a follower of me, you must deny yourself. Then in Luke chapter 6, verse 40, he said, the disciple will never greater than his master. But when he's trained by his master, he will be like him. Mm -hmm. So your calling is confirmed by God. But the people that are going to come to work with you, in spite of you having five, six, 10, 11 people. Listen, to open a synagogue, you need 10 people. You don't need a thousand, you need 10. I'm gonna give you an example. Because the struggle in here is because how these people had thousands and thousands of people and I only got 50, I only got 60. See the volume in churches, you want, a lot, you want everybody to be saved. But a lot of people that confess or profess to be saved, they're not living a safe life. They live in the life that the teacher is instructed them with because they being converted to the leadership of the denomination, not to God himself. Mm -hmm. So having said that, when you are called by God, you have, he completes you. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? And I'm giving you all this information so you can have it so you know what to talk to your, to your people. What God asked Abraham, he said, what about if you're 50? No. What about if you're 20? No, he said, find me 10. If you find me 10, I mean they complete. If they're not, they're not going to destroy it because they're incomplete. And that's what happened. They was not complete. And he destroyed them. So you may have a lot of people. That doesn't mean that you're complete. Mm. Okay. You get it? I'm not finished yet. <laughs> I'm gonna help you. <laughs> so you know when you are called by God, when your passion grows each and every day to learn to do his will, not to please the other people. Most of the people that got thousands and thousands of people, they are people pleasers. That's why they're there. Because they, they teaching them what they want to hear, well, not what they need to hear. The people that have been hated the most is the one that speak the truth. As long as you speak the truth, you're gonna be hated. But when you speak what people want to hear, you're gonna be loved. That's their own reward. You already got their own reward. So I'd rather be Listen to this, ignored by people, but recognized by God. They're being recognized by people and ignored by God. So you there because he calls you. Otherwise, you would not be contacting people to join it, to be part of this vision that is just the beginning. Because what is coming, they're gonna, ask you how God took you there, not us, but your desire and your passion to get to know him and not things about him. Mm -hmm. Get that? Yes, sir. And that's how you know that you have been called by him. Because you got to think individually, not massive. God told Moses, you make sure now the majority, listen to this, you don't follow the majority. You make sure the majority follows you. <laughs> that means that when you and God together, you are the majority. You don't need 20,000 people. That ain't, they not even know where they're going. You ask them what is a historical context, they can't even explain that. So you mean to tell me that you said that you had been saying that you know your maker, you not even know where you came from? Something is out of order. Something is wrong. And it's not the scriptures, it's the way you have been taught. Wow. And that answer your question. 
Yes, sir. Yes, doctor. <laughs> Loud and clear. So that means, that means I will ask this question because uh, I ask again, you know, I think sometimes back, which it's just good to get the clarity. If I am a pastor and I have 1,000 pe people that comes to listen to the word of God, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, from you know time to time, these people start dropping from a thousand. Now it's seven hundred, coming to five hundred, coming to one hundred. Then I remain with five people. Mm -hmm from 1,000 to five people. And, you know, with the number of 1,000, that was like, you're feeling hip hop. You're feeling, wow, you've been called by God and you walk, your shoulders are high. Mm -hmm. If you remain with five people, that these five people comes to listen, you know, from your leadership, they come to listen the word from the word of God and, they come continuously and the, the other 995 left, are you still an effective leader? When you, <laughs> can I lie? Nah, 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 I'm making fun. I'm mocking you, but it, you, made, you made me laugh the way, you, the way you said it. Because what I'm trying to say is that I'm laughing because you're talking to yourself, but I, in the other hand, you're not listening to yourself. Yes. And I, you need to know how to listen to yourself. Uh -huh. That's what I'm laughing. I'm not laughing about you. It's what you said, the way you said it. Yeah. I'm going to explain to you. Listen to this. The Messiah had multitude coming to listen to him. First group. The <laughs> second group, you had the religious elite. And number three, the second share group, 12 disciples. They said to him, that multitudes are living. The Messiah said, you want to go with them too? <laughs> so people have come to hear what they want to hear. For yes, those sir. that remain there, they belong to the Messiah. That's why they don't walk away. Mm. Peter said, where are we going to go? You only have the word for eternal life. <laughs> so they remain there. But the multitude left. The religious that live left. But to remain. Mm. It's that simple. <laughs> look at look at it. Look at this. Look at it this way. If you were the only person on earth from whom the Messiah had to come and shed his blood to pay the price to set you free, he would do it. Mm. He said it. The shepherd has a hundred sheep. One walked away. He left the 99 to go and find the one to drift away. It's right mm. there. So volume doesn't mean. The God is there. Korah had 12, 200 prince with him. Korah, was God there? He yes. was the leader. Well, he opened up the earth and swallowed them. <laughs> See? <laughs> My God. Well, there you go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, any other question from this uh, panel? Like you can hear the man of God is loaded and every question that you have, all the answers are right here. My God. I have something to, have something to say more than an ask, but I want, I want to hear some more a little more about this the doctor jose said god won't teach you nothing if you are not available to obey him first mm -hmm. so so many people are trying to get things from god for their ministry and they're not living they're not even obeyed him on what they have to do so why we are seeing these times people that they pretend they have things but they they don't really have it because they are not acting in obey on God but they you know everybody see them that they got many things 
I know you was talking about the, the what you have is not make you a big or less a leader, but you know, we know people that are not doing what they have to do and they look blessed. So what, what do you have to say about that? Mm -hmm. okay. You asking me? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I thought you were talking to the brother. No, 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 no. Listen, listen, listen. listen no, something listen. that you said. You said God won't teach you nothing uh -huh. if you are not available to obey him first. So I want you to abound. It's that simple. It's, it's, that's very simple. It's, it's not so complicated. That is simple because listen to this. Before he created Adam and Eve, Adam, then Eve, right? He told, he told Adam, everything that you needed, before I created you, I provided for you. In other words, he will give you, he, he always makes sure that you have everything that you need before you get to understand how to walk with him. So he's going to teach you everything that in eternity he had decided to teach you to understand how to obey him. He said, Adam, everything that you needed is right here in the garden. Do not eat from that tree. Obey me first. If you don't, then this is going to happen. You will surely die. And that's that. That's exactly what happened. He died. He, not, he lived 130, 930 years. But he died instantly, right? He broke the commandment. But his physical death took 930 years to embrace the spiritual death, but they die. <laughs> because without obedience, you cannot live according to the eternal one design. That answer your question. Yes. But before we start um, being blessed by mm -hmm. God, so he started teaching us first. So the yes. teaching first, they obey come second, or how are we going to obey if he don't teach us first? So teaching I'm, comes I'm, first, or? Uh -huh. No, I'm sorry, the question. I believe, I believe that I explained that. Before he created Adam, he already has his design, these are four pillars, design, plan, purpose, and will. So he told Adam those four pillars. So Adam, when he placed him in the garden, the only person that was grown big, that was born big was Adam. He doesn't have no mother. <laughs> he was born big. <laughs> he told him what to do and he still doesn't obey him. So in other words, the blessing are wrapped up in the gift box of obedience. Before you get into the blessing, you have to receive the box, the gift box. And once you open it, then you receive that blessing, but you have to obey before getting the box. He told Adam, everything here that you need has been provided. Don't disobey me. See, do this like this, like that. Because you're already blessed. What is the problem? And I'm going to add to that, that answer another drop of answer. You cannot like the anointing more than God's vision. Because he's anointing you to carry on his vision. Mm -hmm. People seeking for anointing, not to, to learn the vision. You cannot like the anointing more than his vision. That answers wow. your question. Yes. Yes, you said it good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, but I have nothing. Oh, um, Maturi have a, a question right there. Just write it down. So um, let him let him know. As uh, this is a question uh from uh, the chat. As I. As a second chair, how do mm -hmm. I handle the first chair who is Alpha and Omega? 
And if I make a suggestion, I'm rebuked. No, he's not the Alpha and Omega. The Alpha and Omega is the, the one that saved him. So he cannot be the Alpha and Omega. That's the problem. That's why you're being rebuked because you think he's the one. <laughs> but if he understands that he's not the one, he understands that you're part of his team and you belong to the one that saved him too. They made on the first share. So as a second share, you're entitled to say whatever you have to say as long as you don't contradict the Bible. It's mm. that simple. <laughs> wow. Well, in your first presentation, uh, Doctor, you said that uh, to obey God is to disobey yourself. Yes. How do you disobey yourself? Okay, let's say one, you, you know you're, you're in full capacity and you have your whole 100% um, level of reasoning, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, your sound mind, right? Right now, get naked and go out there. <laughs> <laughs> you, you follow me? So yes, that, that, that also makes sense. So that means every day, listen to this, we decide to go to bed. He decides if we open up our eyes in the morning. He's in control. So every morning that he allows you to wake up, you decide what to eat, what to dress, where to go. You're obeying yourself, right? To do your things, right? Because he gave her the capacity to do so. But at the same time, above that capacity, he gave her the capacity and the reason and instruction to learn how to obey him. The reason mm -hmm. why you are not obeying him because you're obeying yourself more than himself. Mm -hmm. So in order to obey him, you got to disobey yourself. Don't do things mm -hmm. your way. So your will has to be broken in order for his will to be established. Then you'll be able to live the life according to his will that pleases him. It's that simple. Disobey myself to obey him. You're not going to say, oh, I'm under the grace. Okay. If you're running over there now in Africa and you, for instance, or in Europe, and you pass the red light or stop sign and the police stop you, they say, hey, you just violated the law. You're going to say, oh, no, I'm under the grace. They say, no, you're disgraceful. That's who you are. <laughs> to me, under the grace. You're abusing the grace. You see what I'm saying? So you have to learn how to obey because you tell your children how to obey you. So it's not difficult to obey. You make it difficult. <laughs> mm. if, if you cannot obey, so don't tell your children to obey you then. Because you know obedience is possible. The point is when you want to surrender your will to the one that had to control your life, you don't want to because you want to be in control of yourself. Do you get that? Oh. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Oh my. I'm going to give you a better example right now. I'm going to Can I give you a better example? Yes, sir. Okay. Over there in mother nature, you got many tribes, right? Out there. Your ancestors. Did they have the Lord of Moses? Do they have did do they have a Bible? No. But they had a sheep. Mm -hmm. The sheep used to tell them what to do to the tribe. Why they was never went against them. How come they had a conduct? I mean, they have a manual of conduct and behavior within the tribe. And mm -hmm. the sheep have to say, whatever they have, whatever he said, they used to carry on and do it. You know what the Bible said? That the Gentile have the word of God written in the heart. And they do with the law, not knowing the law, what the law says to do. Mm -hmm. Obedience is not difficult. We make it difficult. Mm. Does that answer don't... your question? We just don't want just to don't obey. Want... <laughs> it's simple. Mm. Mm. Oh my how God. come your neighbor? How come your neighbor doesn't go into your house and get the key that belongs to his house and try to open up your house? Because he you knows he doesn't belong there. <laughs> a neighbor cannot come to you and do whatever he wants. He knows that by nature that he's invaded somebody's territory. He's crossing somebody's line. Unless the person is a corrupted one, he doesn't care. He, he, he lives back on his own laws and do whatever he wants. That's why you got jails. People locked up in jail because they don't want to obey the law. <laughs> Mm. So don't tell me the law is abolished. It's there. See what I'm saying? 
Yes, sir. Listen, you instruct your children to be a good citizen, to abide by the law. But when it comes to obey God's law, it's a problem. I don't get it. <laughs> but we want our children to be good citizens. Why not make them a citizen of heaven to learn to obey they may, they, they heavenly father as well? We have to do that. That's what I said. The only way I'm going to learn to obey my creator as a creature is to disobey myself because he's the creator. I'm the creature. The creature cannot tell the creator what to do. Hmm. It's that simple. Very wow. simple. <laughs> How come you never see a tiger hanging out with a lion? <laughs> How come you never see a tiger hanging out with a panther? Because they know, even though they, they belong to the same kingdom, they don't belong to the same family. <laughs> oh, okay. You follow me? <laughs> oh, my. Oh my. Mm. Well, 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 well. You have to stop. <laughs> so we continue okay. next week. <laughs> well, before we continue, I. Uh, doctor, I have a question uh, that needs uh, clarity, mm -hmm. and uh, that is uh, on still on the effectiveness of uh, rather the characteristics of a uh, of a leader. Yeah. On uh, on point one and point number twenty one yeah, down there, good. where it's written, effective leaders have clean hands and pure hearts. Okay. Then down there, it's also written, mm -hmm. effective leaders are not afraid to get their hands dirty. Now, what is the difference? Say it again, what point? What is the difference between point number one uh -huh. that says effective leaders have clean hands mm -hmm. and pure hearts and Counting from number one, going down up to number 21, it says effective leaders are not afraid to get their hands dirty. Now. Simple. Is that simple? I got you. I got you. I got you. What the Messiah say? Who will abound in his mountain? Those that are pure heart and clean hands. Pure hearts mm -hmm. mean that he, he replaced a stony heart and change it with a fleshly heart, meaning that he's gonna incline a heart to do his will. Mm -hmm. A stony heart means that the person will always do what he wants. Hands in the Bible represent getting the job done. See, mm. so King Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter seven says, that the, the wimps know that the heart is leaking upon the rooftop, but he's there to use his hands to fix it. <laughs> so in other words, the rooftop represents our mind. The hands represent our work. So when you have a heart for God, you do what he wants you to do your hands. You don't afraid to get your hand dirty because God took you from the mud. He dirty his hand to save you and rescue you from the mud, from the dirt, from sin. Mm -hmm. Now he's using you as an instrument, as a tool to do the same thing. What somebody was used by him to do it and save you with other. So you gotta dirty your hands, do his mm -hmm. work. That answer your question. Yes, sir. Wow. Uh, thank you very much for <laughs> uh, that is so deep. That is so deep today. Thank you so much. Let me ask before we come to the end of the meeting, let me ask Apostle Evans Ayuka. I see you're here. Can you kindly unmute your mic and uh, Apostle Evans Ayuka? Can you kindly unmute your mic?
we want to see you. Do you have any question as far as the leadership is concerned? No, I don't have. Okay. Pastor Philip, do you have any question? And mute your mic. Oh, yeah. And mute your mic, Pastor Philip. No. Yeah, go ahead. Hello. Go ahead. Okay, my question is, my question is uh, if you are a leader and there's a leader before you, then you are following the leader who is misleading you. And is your general leader, how can you go about because it's your side, you are serving in the same position? But you realize that you are not being led in a group uh, or in a way. So Philip, there's there's some echo behind. We yeah, are yeah. Not very clear. Yes, not very clear. <laughs> huh? There's some I echo. There's some echo behind you. Maybe you need to uh, fix your mic very well. Okay. Are you getting me well now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, I was asking a question. That you are a leader in a certain area and you are following a leader before you and you realize that leader is not leading in an effective way. How can you go about it? I think to capture that, Doctor, he's asking if you are, uh, if you have a leader that you are second in command in this case, and your leader is not effective enough, how do mm -hmm. you go about it? Following, okay, same. Up, mm -hmm. following up a leader that is not effective. Now, okay. mm -hmm. I just before you, you respond, I gave sometimes back an illustration. Uh, I will allow me to use this again. Sure. You're following a leader who is blind, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And uh, you, the follower, you're following, you can see far, but the leader is not able to see far. Mm -hmm. So, so the people following the leader, they are able to see, but the leader himself or the leader herself is not able to see. What advice can you give to such leader? In other words, okay. maybe a, a leader doesn't have the vision in this case. Okay, the first thing that I do in a case like that is to be uh, patient enough and go in prayer and, and, and ask God, you know, Elohim, uh, creator, to open up his eye, my leader's eye. If not, to accommodate to be able to put together um, principles and also an information that when I approach my leader and be able to share with him more or less where we have been paralyzed or lacking, he able to receive that with humbleness and meekness and be able just to change and put in practice whatever suggestion and advice that I have to offer him to be able to blossom or explode within the congregation. For instance, King David was about to be anointed. Saul was not able to produce anymore because he, led, he went better straight. But King David did not rush into judgment or to take the place that was panda, even though was an answer that the people asked, even though God was not in agreement with that uh, uh, selection by putting Saul there, King David waited his time. You understand? 
he didn't rush and criticize or trying to move so out of his place because individually speaking if you're there it means that you're in the right place you know at the right time to be used by god to be able to help that person that is blind so god be able to open up his eye by your counseling see for instance the messiah jesus had 12 disciples but within the disciple had a he had an intimate circle. He had three, Peter, John, and Jacob. Did he love them, those three more than the other nine? Of course not. But when it comes to maturity, he knew for a fact that he was able to count on these three to carry on the legacy that he was about to pass on to them. So as it is right now, God placed you there to help that leader to carry on that vision, which is what God wants you to be at, by putting in practice their mission, which is how to get there, but in God's time. So the best thing to do, my very advice to him is that, pray and God will give you the um, ideas, not idea, the principles, understand them, uh, to be able to understand the principle, to share that we your leader, like my leader that I have for 20, out of three out of 33 years i was there 28 years but he was able to listen to me because i always used to talk about the vision and the mission and from my seat in the second share bringing suggestions and idea to better the vision of the house never go against the authority respect that authority you got going to make other people to respect yours too even though he's blind Okay, even though he's blind, he knows things that I don't know. So what I know is the thing that I have to share that he needs to understand. Because what God is preparing you for you to do, only you are gonna be able to understand that, to do it his way, but never to contradict his, his word, his scripture. Don't pull your own ideologies, your methodology, use the scripture, to counsel people. Amen? Amen. Is that answer your that's question, clear. brother? Is that clear? Yes. Yes, that's clear. Don't rush. Don't rush. Can I say something else? Yes, sir. Okay. This is one time, this is this is something that I learned. People talk about hypocrisy. He's a hypocrite. He's a hypocrite. He's a hypocrite. I'm leaving this church because it's a disorder here. It's a mess in this church. Meanwhile, God opened your eyes to see the mess, to use you, to bring back the order in that church and you left that church. Who the hypocrite? You the, the hypocrite is you because you left the mess there when he opened up your eye for you to fix it. You the hypocrite. <laughs> uh. So you, <laughs> is that clear? <laughs> no, he didn't open the eyes to nobody else but to you. To see the mess, and you knew exactly everything that you said. This mess is like here because this that is missing. Because we lack in this that he's telling you what to do, but you're not doing it, and you leave in the church, leaving the mess behind because you're the one that are hypocrite. Hmm. So we don't want to fall into that category. We want to be used as an instrument, as a tool in his hand to bring the order that is able to do what he wants to use you. He did it with, D, with King David. He did it with Samuel. When Eli was not able to function as a priest, he already had somebody there. And you're going to be that Samuel. You're going to be that David in that church. Do not leave that church. Wow. Amen. Man, thank you. Uh, Nancy, any question? Uh, Pastor Simon, any question from you? Evans Maturi, any question? Well, the silent means there is no question. And so I want to ask uh, 
before I ask uh, Reverend Nelson to say a word of prayer, I want to ask Papa to say something, uh, your last remarks. And I want to appreciate God because of the doctor. Thank you very much, doctor. We're looking forward for next week as well. And I know it's going to be more powerful. So Papa, welcome. I, I'm okay. I just finished. I just want to say thank you to everyone. And um, we'll see you next week with another powerful teaching with Dr. Jose Layson. Um, yeah. So God bless you. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Papa. God bless you for your coordination. Uh, Reverend uh, Nelson, if you can just unmute your mic and uh, close with a word of prayer, that will be a great blessing. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, and yes, I just appreciate that for those powerful teaching insights. We really appreciate for taking your time to be here. Just to be a blessing to us. The Lord God will my bless you. So let's believe and pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord Almighty, we bless your name in this hour. We just want to thank you for the opportunity you've given us, for Lord, you to pray. And thank you, Lord, for your servant that you used in such a powerful way to teach us, all dear Father, on insights of leadership. And we thank you, dear Lord, for your opportunity upon his life and teach us for giving us wisdom, revelation, the words that he has spoken to us, how he prayed. That every seed that has been planted in our life, that you will be cultivated, that you will grow to be good leaders. The Lord God Almighty, what has been deposited in us, is going to bear fruit, is going to help us, oh Lord, in our journey of Christianity and wherever Lord we position us, oh Lord, to serve you. We pray, Father, that God Almighty will give us new opportunities to learn more. And we just want to pray that Lord God Almighty continue to reveal yourself to him and use him in a special way. That it, as it comes on, oh Lord, that you have more to feed us, oh Lord. We pray for him, we pray for your servant, uh, uh, Lord Ricardo. We commit him before you, oh Lord, and just support him in this program. And thank you for Apostle Robinson. We pray for him as well. As the coordinator, the servant that you uh, used, oh Lord, just to bring us together as we receive such uh, powerful teachings, oh Lord, that are helping us, Lord, in our work of Christianity. We bless your name, oh Father, and honor you and glorify you. Even as we part, may you be with us until we meet again. In Jesus' name, we believe and pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Nelson. Um, I'm so grateful. Uh, we have come to the end of the meeting. I want to appreciate God for those that were able to be part of this uh, on uh, Facebook. Thank you very much. I can see uh, my other good friend here from, from Australia. 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 This, yeah, this is Australia. <laughs> So far, man, God bless you. How are you, friend? Good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Shofar man. Thank you for coming. God bless you. I was oh, to mention you, your friend. name. I was to mention your name on Facebook. Yes, but we appreciate that you are able to come in. We will be here next week again uh, on Thursday, and as Doctor will continue teaching us, I know it's going to be a blessing. We've already made a prayer. And so I celebrate God for each one of us. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. We've come Amen. to the end of the meeting and uh, may the Lord bless you and do you good. Shofaman, do you have to say something? Shofaman from Australia. You know, we've <laughs> had people from Denmark, Pakistan, Kenya, all over the world. So this one is just coming from Australia. You know, you know what time it is in Perth? You know what time it is? 3.24 in the morning. Wow. 3.24 <laughs> in the morning. Wow. You can see that. 3.24 in the morning in Australia. 
and uh, it's uh it's 10 30 in kenya 10 30 p.m and i know time different it's just amazing i know in pr it's about 3 p.m i'm very yeah. sure it's 3 p.m yeah <laughs> hey i'll call in so, midnight my eyes and then i'll be eyes and then not sleeping your eyes open <laughs> Amen. So God bless you, Shofar man. I'm looking forward to see you next week. I want you to come and blow the Shofar next week. Come and blow the Shofar as we learn the leadership way. Next week, come with the Shofar and blow it for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bye, bye everyone. God bless you. God bless you. Yeah, we'll see you next week. Amen. Amen.